afternoon once again. A warm welcome to the Faculty of Management Studies public lecture on the theme governing in times of crisis, navigating the challenges. We would like to call on Dr. Ernest Abraham to tell us why we are here. Thank you, Doc. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All protocols observed. Once again, you are most welcome to this afternoon's program by the Faculty of Management Studies. This afternoon, we are gathered here to be engaged in a public lecture on a theme, governing in times of crisis, navigating the challenges. UPSA is a very forward-looking institution, and our mantra is scholarship with professionalism. In other words, we don't just pursue the knowledge, but we also make sure that we apply the knowledge and then we do so in an ethical manner. So as part of that, we make sure that there's always industry component to whatever we do. So this afternoon we are here to hear from one of the world's finest experts when it comes to governance and leadership. And whatever he will tell us will be the basis for us to engage in some intellectual discussions. And we we'll also receive contributions from you. So we are here, one, to hear from our guest speaker. Then based on that, we'll have some discussions. So I want you to be engrossed with all rapt attention, let's give our best and then be part of this afternoon's program. And I can promise you that we will not regret coming. Thank you very much. And once again, you are almost welcome. Thank you very much, Doc. We can't wait. Okay, I can't wait. I'm sure you can't wait as well. Okay, thank you. Um, can we have the ever beautiful the Dean of the Faculty of Management Studies, Professor Fidelis Kwanza, to give us the welcome address. Oh, hey, the Dean! Thank you very much, Madam MC. Mr. Chairman, our guest speaker, our deans of faculties and faculty members present here, the staff of UBSA invited guests, um, students, and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, the management of UPSA and the Faculty of Management Studies, I greatly welcome you to this great university and also to this all important uh, public lecture. As you already know, governance remains pivotal to human survival and sustenance. It plays a very important role in local, regional, and global affairs. It encapsulates the processes, the systems, and structures by which societies and organizations are directed and controlled. Governance also involves making the decisions, implementing policies, managing resources to achieve specific goals and objectives. Mr. Chairman, the world has gone through various periods of crisis, and as my children will say, the world has gone through many things. And those moments that came, the world stepped up with governance to match up with the challenges and opportunities that came with it. The nature of crisis can vary widely, but it typically involves a significant and often unexpected event or series of events that challenge the stability and functionality of a government or governing body. These crises can occur at various levels of governance. It can be at the national, it can also be at the regional or global levels. But though the nature of the crisis is unique, they often share common characteristics, such as the need to, for effective leadership, crisis management plans, coordination among various agencies and stakeholders, and the ability to adapt to rapidly changing circumstances. How governments handle these crises can significantly impact their legitimacy, public trust, and long-term stability. 
Does crisis management and preparedness an essential component of effective governance in moments of crisis? A well-prepared and well-executed response can make a significant difference in how the crisis affects the company or national reputation or the financial stability and the long-term success. The responsibility of institutions is to be ready to navigate the challenges through effective governance tools and mechanisms. So this public lecture could not have come at a better time than this. I am confident that our guest speaker will take us on an intellectually stimulating and practical, industry-relevant and solution-oriented discourse which can trigger transformation in governance practices in the country and beyond. I urge you all to give your maximum attention to our guest speaker. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for this address, our very own Professor Fidelis Kwanza. Well, at this stage, I have the privilege, I'm the only one who has that privilege, to introduce the chairperson, in fact, the chairman for this occasion. I'm sure you want that privilege, but as we speak, I'm the only one who has that privilege. So this man is a highly experienced and accomplished professional with over 20 years of experience in management. He currently serves as the Director of Finance at Interglobal Partners Limited, where he provides support services for companies in the mining industry and chemical solutions to the Ghana Water Company Limited, as well as undertaking general construction projects. In addition to his role at Interglobal Partners, he is also the owner of the Nash Lodge Hotel in Sunyani. Hey, those who, those who want to go to Sunyani, please, don't let him go scot-free from here. And serves as the president of the Inspanet Foundation and a board member of the Broja Foundation. He is also a director at House Solicitors and a governing council board member at the University of Professional Studies, Accra Enterprise and Innovation Center. He holds an MSc and BSc in accounting and finance option, as well as a postgraduate diploma in strategic management and leadership from Edubex. He has also served as a resource person at the Faculty of Management Studies at this great institution. In addition, he is the sole stockholder and managing partner of Real Tech Consult, an accounting and micro lending firm. He has a wide range of aspirations, including becoming an author, a motivational speaker, financial advisor, life coach, corporate lender, and a philanthropist. I'm here, we'll work it out. <laughs> he is committed to using his skills and experience to make a positive impact in the world and help others achieve their goals. Please, with a clap, strong clap of you, please help me welcome Mr. Richard Owusu. Chairman, your people. People, your chairman. Thank you very much, Doc. Let me start with wishing every one of you here a very, very good afternoon. And then again, to my dear friend, thank you for those kind words. In fact, at a point I was thinking whether I was being the way to listen. <laughs> and let me also thank the rank and file of the Faculty of Management for the trust they repose in me in appointing me as the chair of such a very crucial public lecture team governing 
in times of crisis, navigating the challenges. In these times of uncertainty and rapid change, the significance of good governance cannot be overemphasized. And I hope every one of you agree with me. Like I always say, entrepreneurship has more or less become a prerequisite of human advancement. And entrepreneurship is a bed meat of good governance. Just as we know the AIs, the robotics, and the algorithms have come with its own advantages, it has also come with some kind of crisis. But there is one thing that we could be assured of, that is the innate ability of the mind cannot be toppled by any form of artificial intelligences. Therefore, it is rightly so that when we talk of good governance, we cannot overemphasize, and there wouldn't be any time better than today to, to share such an insight on good governance. Again, let me extend my heartfelt felicitations to the very venerable Kweku Awechi, who is going to do justice to this course. I have no doubt in my mind that by the time this dialogue will be over, each and every one of you will pick some asset home. Your capital is your information. And the information you hear determines who you are. Some people say knowledge is power. But I do say knowledge is only potential to power. Knowledge is only potential to power. In the sense that the quality of the information one hears or that one consumes determines his state of mind and in extension determines whether he will do well in society or not. So beyond the knowledge that we acquire, it is also imperative that we ascend to quality information. And I know the very venerable Kweku Awachi will do justice to that, and we shall go here out of this place with a better proposition and understanding of good governance. As the chairman, my role is to create a very open, respectful, and constructive dialogue environment, and I'm going to do exactly that. And always remember my usual saying that strength is always in the mind and not in the arms. Thank you very much. At this point, we want to invite again uh, Professor Fidelis Kwanza to introduce our guest speaker. So for our guest speaker, he is currently the board chairman of United Bank of Africa the Multimedia Group Limited in Ghana, and the non-profit sports for development organization, Play Soccer Ghana, which he co-founded in 1999. He has been the past board chairman of Stambik Ghana Limited, that is from 2012 to 2018. The Ghana's Volta River Authority, that is from 2017 to 2021 and the board member of several energy and mining organizations across Africa. He's also an electrical engineer by training. He started his career designing integrated circuits for ITT and GERCA respectively between 1984 and 1988. He worked for Kezia Aluminium and Chemical Corporation between 1990 and 1998. I'm sure at that time some of you were not born. Where he left as business manager of the primary aluminium business unit. He's also, he was also the chief executive of Ghana's Volta River Authority that was 2009 to 2013. And most recently, executive vice president and managing director of Talo Oil UK and Talo Oil Ghana respectively from 2018 to 2020. Mr. 
RP has an MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business, Stanford, California, and a BSc in Electrical Engineering, Economics, and Political Science from Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. So, with a, a round of applause, let us welcome to the podium Mr. Kutun Awaki. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the, the Dean of the Management uh, School uh, for uh, honoring me with this invitation. And um, it's great to be part of an academic setting because I know you ask all the tough questions and have the inquiring mind. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be here uh, to hopefully share a few of my own thoughts and uh, hopefully listen to you as well. So uh, your dean was, uh, gave me a really tough task. It's a pretty tricky subject, don't you think? Governing in times of crisis. Um, but um, I think hopefully I'll be able to share a few lessons I've learned along the way and um, hopefully that'll be interesting to you. So let me start by my first slide, hopefully it'll really talk about two broad thoughts. One leads us into crisis in the first place. And today, the world is in crisis, isn't it? We have wars in the Middle East, in Europe. Uh, we have our own internal crisis. Uh, I, I've got some local ones we can talk about. Um, are they failures of governance or are they acts of God? accidents. What leads us into crisis? So I've got two first-hand experiences. I was there. I can tell you about them. Um, and I've got a couple which we all may know about. And then I've got one that I know a lot about. And then the question from those experiences is, what do we learn from those experiences? What counts for success or failure in crisis management? So I've got five case studies, uh, as I said. So uh, let's see um, my five. Uh, my first one is Ashanti Goldfields. Uh, your dean mentioned I worked there. Maybe she didn't mention it. But I worked there um, for six years in the late 90s. Um, and we had a, a liquidity crisis. For those of you in management, we almost went bankrupt. Then I was, uh, at the, as the CEO of VRA, uh, I was a board member of the West African Gas Pipeline. And some of you may remember the pipeline broke about 10 years ago in 2012. And that was a crisis for YP. And there were some very interesting lessons from that. I'll move from Ghana to an international stage. How many of you have heard of the US-Cuban Missile Crisis? I'm curious. Show of hands, anybody who has heard of the US missile crisis? Not many. So, long time ago, 1962, so I don't blame you, that was the last time the world was at the brink of nuclear war. Literally, at the brink of nuclear war. We talk about Hamas and the Palestinians and Russia and Ukraine. This was the last time Russia and the US were toe-to-toe -to -toe ready to fire their nuclear missiles. And for anybody in management and policy making, this is one of your benchmark case studies and how decisions get made at a time of crisis. So I thought, let me add that for your benefit. We come back into Ghana and talk about things that we are familiar with. What did we learn from the COVID crisis a couple of years ago? What are we learning today from our IMF engagement to support our economy? Those are crises too. What are we learning about those? And finally, I will end with my old Volta River Authority. Uh, those of you who have family in the Volta region, some parts of Eastern, a lot of our family members have been flooded. And that's a crisis. How did that happen? What lessons do we learn? So let me start with the Santiago Fields. I mentioned I was there. Uh, this is uh, in 99, 
September 1999. It's a long time ago now, I realize. Um, and I was the head of business development at the time. Um, so a brief uh, background on the gold market. In the late 90s, we were at historically low gold prices. Uh, who can tell me the price of gold today? Anybody? The price of gold today is almost $2,000. A, 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 a troy ounce. In 1990, it was 250. And it had been low for a number of years. And a lot of companies, what they would do is they would hedge. They would protect on the downside. So those of you in finance, uh, you would understand you would buy uh, instruments where basically it said it would protect you. If the price of gold went below 250, you were protected. You basically bought or sold at that price. That's called a put. Those of you in finance and hopefully in management, you would, uh, you would uh, understand that. Now, what's interesting about gold, gold is money. So a lot of companies in the commodity business, whether it's oil and gas, whether it's cocoa, we hedge. We do forward sales. You want a, a predictable cash flow. So gold is no different. The difference is that because gold is money and the banks store gold in vaults, I can buy instruments that are 10 years out. No other commodity allows you to do that. And Ashanti Goldfields at the time had a very sophisticated hedge book and we hedged out, we bought instruments that went out 10 years. We were producing over a million ounces of gold every year and we were protecting ourselves so that when the price of gold went down, we would be protected. And all of a sudden, in September, a number of things happened. I think uh, a couple of the central banks in Europe uh, said we're going to limit the sale of gold and the price of gold started to go up. Now, you would think under any other normal circumstance, you would be happy. But actually what happens is that when you buy these instruments, it locks you in. So as it goes up, you are exposed. And we were exposed. Now, what was interesting about what was happening to Ashanti was that we had what we call margin calls. And anyone who buys instruments of any kind, financial, oftentimes the bankers want uh, collateral. So if the price went up $10, they want to not lose all of that. Many other companies in the West didn't have the same, let's call it rigorous margin calls we did, but we were in Africa. So risk premium, a bit worried. And as the price of gold went up for a variety of reasons, we did not have the money to pay that margin call in September of 1999. Now, those of you who know anything about banking is the banking industry is a very small industry. It quickly became known in the city of London where we had most of our banking, Ashanti did not have money. And everybody, like they do on a run on banks, came knocking on our door and says, where is my money? And we didn't have it. What we told our bankers hedge counterparties, the people we bought these very sophisticated instruments from is, don't worry, we have the money, it's in the ground. Don't worry, just be patient, you will get your money. And true story, because I was part of those negotiations, almost everybody said, mm, that's, that's, that's right, except one. That one was an insurance company from the U.S. said, nope, I don't believe you, give me my money. And that then unraveled everything we were trying to do because if you don't have the money, what do you do? You declare bankruptcy. Our share price went from $7 a share to about $1.50. Our shareholders got very upset with us. They sued us. They sued management. Sadly for us, the government of Ghana joined that suit. They wanted, they said, Ashanti, badly run, terrible company, we must sack all of you. So we don't have the money, 
We're going bankrupt. Our shareholders are fighting us. What did we do? So as I mentioned, I was not on the board, but I was a senior executive. Every day, every day, for 30 days, the board met. They met first. How did we get here? And when they found out how they got here, they said, what do we do about it? So every day we would meet the whole board, there were ministers on the board, various kinds of people on the board, and they would call in management and ask, what happened that today we didn't have the $30 million we should have had on any other day of the year? And then they asked management, so how come you put on these very sophisticated instruments. Uh, who, who, who told you to do that? And the CFO, who was a brilliant man, one of the most brilliant men I've ever met, true story, said to the board, well, I did it, and I didn't tell the board. Guess what happened to him? He lost his job. He lost his job. Consequences of a brilliant guy who did things without proper governance. Anyway, we sorted ourselves out slowly. Our bankers supported us. Uh, they, they supported us and came to uh, show us a sign of support to the government of Ghana and said, this management is good. If you sack them, you lose us too. And uh, we, we slowly restructured our hedge book and it took us two or three years, but our share price slowly recovered. Obviously, we didn't go bankrupt. But that 30-day period in September, when we didn't know whether we would survive, was one of the most important lessons I've learned about what do you do at times of crisis. What were the ingredients? If you didn't have the correct information, you would not know what to do. Right? Uh, and not everybody always shares the right information. I'm sure many of you have been in places where you ask what happened, and the person will go round and round and round, and you have no idea what he said at the end. But we had to force very honest conversations, what really happened, and they were difficult conversations. As I said, people lost their jobs. Uh, we restructured the board completely. Uh, uh, Sam Jonah at the time had a lot of what we call executives on the board. We replaced about half of them with independents. And that's one of the lessons about governance that you learn. Governance is about independent thinking, challenge, getting the right information, getting the right people in the room. Uh, we, we lose sight of that often. But because we had the right people in the room, we asked the tough questions. We demanded the tough questions. And we didn't like the answers sometimes because the answers showed us up, showed us how we had not managed the company properly. We had done some good things, but there was no reason for us to be where we were that day. And there were consequences. So that was a very powerful lesson for me as a young executive at the time. And it, it, it teaches you what you need to do at times of crisis. Maybe another very important lesson I will share is it's, it's constant engagement, continual engagement with your stakeholders, whoever they are, your bankers, your shareholders, your executive, because if you don't do that, time during crisis is of the essence. So that was my first lesson in governing at times of crisis. Let me talk about the second one. Um, I mentioned that in 2012, uh, as a CEO of the VRA and a board member of the West African Gas Pipeline, the pipeline broke. I don't know whether any of you remember this. Very interesting set of circumstances. Uh, a ship was captured by pirates, being chased by the Navy, 
And as it was being chased, it let it anchor down, and it dragged on the seabed, bed, and it cut the pipe. The pipe is a, a big thing, 18 inch, it's a huge thing. And immediately we lost the gas supply from Nigeria. At the time, gas supply from Nigeria was going very well, and all of a sudden, gone. And first time that had happened, none of us knew what would happen next. No idea, it had never happened before, why would it? Why would such a thing happen? Now, so there were many aspects to that particular crisis. I mean, from a certain point of view, we didn't have gas, not good, but we had crude oil, so we could still power our plants. That was manageable. What actually got the West Africa Gas Pipelines Company interest, the particular interest of the company, was when it happened. So you can imagine you have this very high pressure tube, snaps, snaps in Benin offshore. 200 miles down Takradi, when it connects to our what we call our metering station, because there's solid steel, and at some point there's not steel, because there's has to connect to a few things. It snaps and it whips around like a, a rubber band. And it just so happened there were two people there at the time. Kills them instantaneously. Instantaneously it was terrible. Now many of you would think, wow, that was an accident. That was an act of God. We would think that, right? But no. The West African Gas Pipeline Company is an interesting company. We're still delivering gas. Uh, Chevron and Shell own more than 50% of it as shareholders. NNPC, the Nigerian National Petroleum Company, own about 20 odd percent, I forget the right number. And BRA, as the primary customer and shareholder for the government of Ghana, we own 16. So we are the shareholders. As we sat down to ask ourselves what happened that these two people lost their lives that day, to think about it, we could have, act of God, sorry, oh, condolences to the family, end of story. We sat down for days. What happened? Because anybody should tell you that. Nobody should ever lose their lives on a job. Nobody. And as a company, if that happens to your staff, that is your responsibility, whether it's an accident or not. How did it happen? Very interesting. What we found out was that actually, when we were laying the pipe, the Ghanaian secondees from BRA told the Chevron secondee, do it this way and not that way. And the Chevron secondly thought they knew better and did it the way they wanted. And a lot of the dangers that we were afraid of happened on that day. Now, there are a few other things that happened, but what was the lesson there? The lesson there was that West African Pipeline Company at the time were made of five major shareholders. Chevron, Shell, NNPC, VRA, Togo Benin. And we, we worked as if there were five different companies in West African Gas Pipeline Company. So Chevron would appoint the MD, Shell would appoint the finance person, VRA would appoint whoever. And those people, first point of call was to their line manager sitting, who knows where, New York, Houston, Nigeria, and we did not work as a team. And if we had worked as a team, if we had said, no, hang on a minute, we are a team, are we doing the right thing? Perhaps that design would have been done differently. And those people would not have lost their life. So we embarked on quite an interesting exercise. Of course, the physical aspects of fixing that pipe were easy, we were all engineers. But then we spent over a year and a half 
completely overhauling the culture of that company. So that instead of five companies in one, you were one company. Can you imagine how difficult that is to change the culture, how people think, how people report? It took us over a year to do it. So here you are, you have a crisis, you lose two of your men. They may not have been senior men, but you lost them anyway. And the company, to its credit, realized that, wow. Now that we understand what happened, we cannot let this happen again. Again, what was required? Very extensive analysis. We did a root cause analysis report, if you understand that. Um, but we engaged, talked to each other, and now analyzed and came up with solutions. So that was something, again, I was, I was there. And I, I saw how we then made the changes that changed the culture of WAPCO. So the WAPCO today is a very different company from the WAPCO of 12 years ago because of that exercise. So I've given you two examples where I was there. I want to talk about something I wasn't there about. And I mentioned the U.S. Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's interesting to me that very few people know about it. Of course, I spent a lot of time in the U.S., but this is the benchmark study of crisis management. What happened in October of 1962? So think about this. I know some of you may or may not appreciate this. We were at the height of the Cold War. Russia and the US, a bit like today US and China. <laughs> Everything Russia did was with suspicion. Everything the US did was with suspicion. Even Africa, you know, the, the Cold War was played out on the continent. Everybody was looking for their proxies. And of course, a lot of spying going on. And sometime in October of 1962, the U.S. would fly their normal in, uh, intelligence flights, taking satellite pictures, and they found a huge buildup of strategic missiles on the island of Cuba. So remember, this is at the height of the Cold War. And the U.S. has always felt that Cuba is, 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 is in their hemisphere. And the Russians have somehow managed over a number of months to build a huge arsenal. I mean, they were not playing games. They were not playing games. And so President Kennedy was the president at the time. They find this out and they say, what do we do? We can do nothing. I mean, what can they do? Uh, what can they do? We can invade, we can strike, but you know, this uh, could escalate. You know, we are hearing about the Hamas Palestinian war and how it's potentially escalating. This was not Palestinians and Israelis. This was Russia and the U.S. And they had, the, at that time, the biggest stockpiles of nuclear weapons at that time. So they could do nothing and call the Russians bluff. Or they could be very aggressive. They could try diplomatic channels. And so President Kennedy assembled his top 10 to 15 men in national security. He literally locked them in a room. And he said, leave all your titles behind. You are no longer the head of logistics or strategic planning or finance. You are working for the country. And you need to think of the country first and come up with solutions. And they looked at every possible idea of the implications of all their different actions. And then they finally came up with what uh, was called a blockade. They blockaded the island so that now the ships couldn't come in. Now, if you think about it a little bit, and it's not even the solution, the, the blockade was sort of halfway between nothing and aggression. But it gave the Russians time to back off, face-saving solution. Everybody sort of calmed down. And over time, the Russians slowly de-escalated and took their stockpiles away. But in 1962, the world was OK. 
what is the U.S. going to do on this matter? We are the closest we've ever been to nuclear war, and that is not a lie. But what were the lessons there? We had the right people in the room. They put away all their organizational alliances. Uh, they confronted the facts. Uh, they analyzed their options. And then when it came time, they communicated. So that's some of the lesson there. I want to move to Ghana, which we all know a bit more about than the US. And I want to give us two examples of crisis management, and you will have to tell me how well we have done. Not right now, but afterwards. So we were all here when COVID struck. We closed the borders, closed the lockdown, around March or thereabouts of 2020. And for many, many months, international borders were closed, schools were not in, churches, schools, locked down. We had a, a fairly good vaccination drive. Uh, but I think many of you will remember the president's national addresses, fellow Ghanaians. We, we joke about it. That constant communication put a lot of us at ease, did it not? It told us what was going on, showed leadership. And Ghana today is thought of as one of the best managed COVID experiences. I mean, I think there was a real fear at the time because you know most African countries were not alone. Hospital capacity, medicine, we don't have it like the West. But somehow, with, with the rallying cry of our leader, uh, it helps that we have a young population. Uh, but look at the outcome. I looked at some numbers the other day. 172,000 cases. This is a record. It's not, uh, this is WHO. 165 in carbon, and we had at least recorded less than 1% mortality rate. Compared to many other countries, you would, you would call that pretty good. You would call that pretty good. So here we have a worldwide crisis. Is that, is that an act of God? Maybe. But look how we managed it. Were we successful? What would you say about that? So we fast forward a couple of years. Move to the next slide. And um, I think in July of 2022, not long ago, about a year ago, the president announces we are going to the IMF because actually we can't pay our bills anymore. <laughs> but it has huge consequences to the population. We are here. Inflation went up over 50%. Today it's still very high. Interest rates very high. The CD went from six to fifteen dollars. CDs a dollar, over a hundred percent. It came down all right. What is relevant about that? The purchasing power of your average Ghanaian was just eroded, and we know this. You felt it. It's happening today. Are we in crisis? Is it an act of God? Is it an accident? What are we doing about it? Uh, you could say, verdict. Government has engaged IMF, we reached staff level agreement in record time. And we are even now in our first review, those of you who follow the news, and we've brought in, or are about to get, the second 600 million of a $3 billion package. And uh, for some sense, the economy has stabilized somewhat. But the price has been high. Uh, banks, pension holders, bond holders, the economic price of this particular crisis, which is happening as we speak, has been very high, and many of us have felt it. So the question is, how well have we managed it? Not for me to tell you, for you to think about what have we done in terms of engaging the stakeholders, analyzing the problem, fixing the problem, communicating the solution, in a way that brings the kind of 
stability that we're looking for. You could argue we have stability, um, but those of you who have an understanding of economics, we still have a long way to go before we get to a better place than we are today. How have we managed that crisis? Um, so my last example is uh, something that I know very well, the VRA. And as I said, uh, those of you, who of you have families in the water region? I'm curious, anybody? Here, a few hands here. 36,000 people and going have been displaced. That's a lot of people. Maybe we sitting in a crowd don't feel it, but I think many of you have seen the pictures, the devastation. Is it a crisis? Is it an act of God? Let me uh, share a different example for you, very similar. That happened a month before this crisis. A huge storm, climate change, call it whatever you want. Two dams broke. Over 11,000 people lost their lives. That's a lot of people. In Ghana, in Germany, nobody lost their lives. The devastation was massive. Is that an act of God? If anybody knows anything about Libya, uh, Libya is in a power vacuum. Ever since Gaddafi died, you have two African governments running. And they don't talk to each other. <laughs> how to make decisions, how to communicate the right thing. Do you think that the current political situation in Libya has anything to do with the fact that 11,000 people lost their lives in this so-called act of God? And the answer is absolutely, because their systems of governance were not working. They were not talking to each other. They were not observing protocol. 11,000 people died. You could say, Ghana, we're pretty lucky. Nobody has died, so we're here. But 36,000 people have been displaced. Huge property loss. Uh, if you listen to the radio, the news, there's no water food, worries about health, cholera. And so, in the theme of this particular uh, session, were there failures of governance, or was it an accident? And if we were President Kennedy, or Sam Jonah, or one of these guys of West African Gas Pipeline, would we be doing the things to diagnose the problem, to understand what really happened, address those problems, and fix them. And I think one of the lessons that I would say comes across in these crises that have happened over time, the ones that have been managed, the communication was very strong. Whether it's fellow Ghanaians, whether it's President Kennedy getting on the radio and saying, this is what is going on. When I was at Ashanti, during that 30 days, we had to meet the bankers every day to tell them what we were doing. Because they didn't trust us. They didn't believe us. Every day, we told, this is what we're doing, and they would ask us a ton of questions. It took us a while to come up with a solution. But that communication was a lifeline to the solutions we finally came up with. Remember, they could have pulled the plug and made us bankrupt the next day. But because we engaged them, they said, okay, let's see. We slowly built up our trust and we got past the crisis point. Oftentimes, the last point I'll make about crisis management, and those of you in management and some of you are here, Organizations have what you call standard operating procedures, how we do things. Now, times of crisis, 
those SOPs become very important. Why? Because if you do them well, you can address the crisis. If you don't do them well, you are overwhelmed. If you don't do good reporting, capture your records, you don't, you don't manage your day-to-day -day of any organization. When it comes time for crisis, there is no way you are ready to manage those crises. So one of the things that you realize in crisis management, uh, we've talked in all cases about the quality of information that you get. So you and I both know Professor here can say A is equal to B plus C. Uh, this madame here will say A is equal to B plus C. Same information. We know and we have seen. I won't believe her, but I'll believe her. Have we not seen that before? It happens a lot. So information by itself is filtered regularly, all the time, by our institutional biases whether they are personal, organizational, whether the incentive is, well, I have a boss who's not here, he's sitting in Houston, so I don't have to listen to you. I've told you the truth, all right. So having the right information is actually not enough. What are those biases that you bring to receiving that information? I think I'm not a woman, but many women would say to Many men, you don't take us seriously. Often happens. In the US, you know, many black people would say, white people don't take me seriously. Same information. So we have to ask ourselves when we are in crisis, do we actually get the right information that we then know what to do about? And we have the right people around the table to help us diagnose and come up with the right options. So, and, and what's our communication strategy? So, I mean, I, I have to say this because I, you know, I did work for the BRA for many years. I heard them speak over the weekend uh, at one of the Saturday news programs, a senior executive of the BRA, and uh, the interviewer says, so, did you, did you know what was going to happen? Were you overwhelmed? He says, no, we were not overwhelmed. We knew what was going to happen. And the interviewer says, you knew what was going to happen? He says, yes. He didn't make any mention about property damage, about people being displaced. Do you, do you think that was a good communication that he passed on to the general public? So when people are upset, our communication strategy becomes key in our success. My final slide. Many of the examples that I know of, uh, certainly that we've talked about today, they may start as an act of God, as an accident. If you are willing to dig down, do the analysis, you actually find many of these are man-made problems we have created so that when the act of God so-called comes, we are actually not ready. And that also happens a lot. We may say, well, Storm Daniel, climate change, whatever, the Russians did it behind my back. How come you didn't know? How come you didn't communicate? How come you are not ready? I would argue that a lot of what happens in times of crisis is a result of poor governance that slowly builds up to the place where the gold price is now rising and I didn't know that I didn't have the money. And whose fault was that? So I would summarize and identify a few ingredients for successful crisis management. The accuracy of your information, timely. 
a comprehensive diagnosis and analysis of what has happened and how you will resolve it. The right people around the table, that's difficult. That can be very difficult. And when you work in the government sector, that is even more difficult. At least if you are in the private sector or a whole little company or you have an entrepreneur you're setting up, you get to pick who you want. It doesn't happen in many other places. But if you don't have the right people, how are you going to fix the problem? And then it's also about incentives and structures. And uh, we we'll talked a little bit about the West African gas pipeline. And the last and not the least, communication, communication, communication. Thank you very much. Ready for questions. Uh, I think there were some, for me, the key takeaways here was, I mean, in times of crisis management, some of the elements that you cannot overlook, that is the right diagnosis. And then again, communication, as we all know, communication actually is the feedback for champions. So it cannot be underscored. Let me relate this to a classical scenario that I'm confronted with, especially with our venerable guest speaker, who is very well versed in the banking and the financial spectrum. Now we entrepreneurs, so I mean, young businesses are struggling with our finances. Of course, we all know the issue of the general economic weakness and financial structure not being in a proper or enabling environment to smoothen loans and all that stuff for the borrowers. We are confronted with a situation where we have to borrow from a triple A or a mainstream market at a rate of 41%. That is the hardcore interest rate, not even to talk of the EPR. And at these trying times, when you find yourself that, would you advise that we still go ahead and borrow at 41% or we should hold business and let people go and stay home and come back later when things man down? Thank you very much. My question is, um, I think the speaker made mention of two important points things when we get ourselves into crisis we have to consider he said we first have to ask questions like how did we get here and then try to find out how we can come up with solutions to that and then my question is is it every um, situation that requires that patience to ask the question how did we get here or some of the crisis need an urgent um, attention before you sit to seek for this um, questions and then answers to that fact. Thank you so much. And then also, I'm um, glad about the communication aspect. I think uh, most of the damages that is caused to our hearts and the situations we find ourselves is lack of proper communication. And I'm glad I picked something from that. Thank you. Thank you very much, our presenter. I think this was more practical from his long years of service. And we have really been blessed for being part of this uh, presentation. Uh, I just want to touch on a few things from the presentation. Maybe starting with the last one, the spillage of the dam. I also listened to the conversation and one of the suggested solutions to it would have been can't we harvest that water? Because Bangary is suffering. Why didn't you do that? And then you are wasting the water. Now, my second question that is going to my mind in terms of where, how we got to this place, the crisis that we have found ourselves, the economy on its knees. 
and we going back to the IMF. We said well, we're not going, then we have gone back. And always the, the, the phrase that we hear, we need to tighten our belt. Who is tightening the belt? <laughs> Who is supposed to tighten the belt? Is it the individual or is it the government? Where are we going to cut? And I want to get your thoughts on this. Some people argue that it has never happened in any part of the world for you to create six regions at a goal. We have free senior high also going. Does it require maybe, maybe I'm just thinking, maybe communication for us to get it right. Maybe there is something going on in this country that maybe the profits or the benefits will come in the long term to come that we are not seeing. But for you to create six new regions at the goal, somebody made a position that, somebody position was that it has never happened in any part of the world. And we have done it. Could it be part of it? So who should tighten the belt? Is it we the individual or is the government? Thank you very much. The high cost of financing makes it very difficult for small businesses to thrive. Um, for the private sector to grow. And that has been the case for a long time. Do we know why interest rates are high? Who can tell me? Happiness to this high cost of interest rate. One being the high rates of non-performing loans, that the NPLs. And the other one got to do with, I mean, gross mismanagement of the economy. Because if the government is borrowing from the banks at high rates on the treasury bills at up to 30% GR, it is obvious that the commercial banks will have to do some 10% margin to it. So these are some of the reasons why we have encountered this high risk. Um he said a lot of it, but I also want to add that we have high inflation rate. And we are trying to curb that by um, hiking our interest rate, our interest rate, which is done by the commercial banks. No, sorry, by the central bank, Bank of Canada. So they are hiking the rates in order to lower um, inflation rate, right? And inflation rate is not going down, but we still have hiking if, um, um, interest rate. So that is really what is causing that. So all of these, um, all of these have something to do with the reason why interest rates are high. But there's actually a very simple reason why interest rates are high. The government borrows from the domestic market because it can't meet its budget deficit. So it borrows. So. In the financial markets, the government is the biggest borrower, high interest rates, it's what, it, it's what it, it crowds out the private sector. And so what happens with the banks, which I, I, I'm involved in, you will hear uh, many banks, a lot of what they do is just buy t -bills because the government needs the money. And this is how they finance the running of the economy. It's as simple as that. The government cannot meet its budget deficit, borrows from the domestic market. Uh, it is the primary borrower and the commercial banks. So it's a circle. If I'm a bank and I can make 30% on my T-bill, why would I lend to the chairman? <laughs> why, why, why would I do that? For less than <laughs> why would I do that? Yeah. Yeah. And that has been a pattern for a long time. Now, why does the government not have enough money to finance its ongoing? Again, we heard of free SHS, but that's a recent phenomenon because it's a historical fact. We do not mobilize the domestic resources necessary to pay our bills. It's like any household. If you don't make enough money and you have to buy food every day, what are you going to do? You are going to borrow. So, one of the country's biggest problems, and today when we go to the IMF, those of you who listen and pay attention, the public sector bill plus interest 
that we pay for debt is more than 70% of what we make. Interest on debt, the public sector wage bill is 70% of all the money we generate. So why would I have enough money for you, you, you and me? So what, and this is something again that is not new, because over the years, Ghana has relied on the states to develop the country. It started a long time ago. When we talk about the engine of growth, well, we still want the state to run the secondary schools. We still want the state to open the farms. We still want the state to do just about everything. It suits us also politically. And so we continue to have a big state, a big government, a big wage bill, and the private sector is at the bottom of the list. And that's why interest rates are high. Okay, that's why inflation is high because can't keep up. And you know, we hear of the diversification of the economy and the need to restructure. And we've not really been successful. Those of you who follow the economy, manufacturing as part of the economy, flat to declining. Services have come up. The growth in the economy uh, comes from our commodities. Cocoa, gold, oil. But agriculture, which could be the big, you know, enabler, we, we have a very sort of uh, schizophrenic view of it. So that's why uh, interest rates are high. Inflation, because the government uh, wage bill expenditures, all the things it has to do crowd out everybody else. And what some countries are doing, and, and we know this, um, they cut their government commitment. Ivory Coast, uh, I think the president cut his ministers by half. We really need all these people running around? The answer is no, we don't. Uh, but it suits us. Um, so I think that is a challenge we have as a country, where the government is actually crowding us out as individuals, as the private sector, and it'll take some time to fix. So that's hopefully an answer. You may not like it. Um, hopefully that'll change, but it'll take time. And it takes a very deliberate, it's not a, it's not a light switch. It'll take time. I think the lady asked about urgency. I thought that's a good question. Uh, no, oftentimes you don't have the time, but you spend the time that is necessary. So in the case of President Kennedy, he literally locked his leaders in a room for 10 days before he made a decision. You may not even have that time, okay. uh, but uh, there are many, many instances of where organizations spend sleepless nights to identify a problem. And I think what happens a lot, you can tell me, is we often have or we do not have a sense of urgency. When something happens, we, we do not, it is time to fix it. We, we just let it go. That happens a lot. But oftentimes, you have to do whatever is necessary to fix the problem, and that's not always the case. Uh, professor talked about spillage. Uh, so, good question about spillage. Um, the way Akosumbudnam was constructed we, we, we cannot do much more with it than the way it's constructed. That there, you know, if you want to build another dam, it has to be somewhere else. There's some new, te there's some technologies uh, that we just can't do it where they are. It's not that easy to do. Um, I think the real question is, um, have we wasted the, ma the water, right? Uh, and um, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, it just so happens the lake is very high. Could we have prevented the flooding? Uh, take your pick. If I was in Libya, could I have prevented 11,000 people? I, I'm just giving you contrast. Could we have prevented the displacement of 36,000 people? I would suggest we probably could have done a lot more than we've done. Uh, you know, they need to answer that question. But it, it's not that difficult to get the facts. It's actually not that difficult to get the facts. So back to the lady's question, do we have a sense of urgency to 
get the facts, fix the problem. What do you see and what do you hear? Any more? Thank you. To carry out what we know is good for us. Um, I remember very well when the current government came to power. Before that, during the campaign, there was a mantra of your discussion as you will become the year. And the explanation is that Ghana has no excuse to be poor. We have no excuse why we should run into any crisis for, for that matter. But I find that over the years, African, African governments have allowed our economies to be over-dollarized and over-reliant over on imports. I remember growing up, there was this song that was sung on the airwaves on the radio. Um, <laughs> Some of you are young, may not have heard that song. But our koto, our name, our snails were trampled down, were looked down in favor of Tinapa, Noni Sardin, and then our And so that is where I was, our trouble started. And I was thinking that when, especially when this government came into power, with the idea of um, self-reliance and self-dependence, we will move away from over-reliance on importation and, 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 and the dollarized economy. But we have continued the trend. Everything, almost everything we, we, we consume, about 50, 60 percent is imported. Over 60 percent of the rice we eat is imported. Over 40 percent of chicken we, we eat is imported. Now, if you are importing everything and killing the local industry, there is no way local industries are going to be able to generate uh, sufficient uh, what you call it, uh, capital to support the economy. And that's also going to force government into a very tight corner. So I think that some of these issues, some of these things are preventive. So if we are going to look at being able to get out of crisis, we need to get back into the boardroom and look at some of the policies that we we out. For instance, why must we, for instance, import the clothing when we have textile factories that are produced locally? Because the more we import, the more we kill our economy. And, and the more difficult it becomes for government. Government cannot uh, get the necessary taxes from local industries or local firms when the firms are not doing well. And therefore, the tax, the tax bracket becomes skewed. Only those who can be taxed are taxed. Those working in government sectors, we have no option but to pay our taxes because controller will take it away anyway. But if you had grown the economy, grown the local economy, it becomes easy for government to be able to widen the tax net and collect more tax that can help us cushion ourselves against some of these crises. So I think some of it has to do with policy issues. Uh, I happen to be part of some decision making at the time. Um, we were in a crisis, you have to procure certain items, you know. Is it a time for us to be doing the, the right things? For instance, we all know the public sector, we have to go to more competitive people. When a crisis, you need medicine, you need um, nose mask, you know all those things. Uh, how do we call what the nurses, the BPs. Is it a time for us to be going through competitive bidding and for us to get the right person to provide those things? So I need some clarity here. Because certain decisions were taken and that was why we were able to get certain things as early as possible to supply to some institutions. I know that I remember at the time I was saying, look, you were asking us to take decisions. Can we please write to your audit service? That this is a crisis, and therefore we cannot go through the normal process in procurement. And uh, it was not that I later got to know, and we all heard it on the radio. After everything, people are complaining, oh, and you didn't do this, you were supposed to do this. So I need the clarity here 
when we are in crisis, is it the time for you to go through the standard operating uh, measure? Thank you very much. From your experience, where and when does the crisis begin in relation to people, communication, systems, or culture? Thank you. Yes. One of the ingredients the uh, Sawaki mentioned was getting the right people on, on board. Uh, let's say a company runs into crisis and then at that time there seems to be no right person or they, they do not have the right person in place. You do have to dissolve the team and then set up a new team to get them out of the crisis or they just add up to the team that led the whole uh, company down into the crisis. Do we dissolve the team or we, we, we just add up the right to go to the numbers to, to um, resolve the issue? That's my question. I like the one about the SOPs. Um, if you heard me, um, if we an organization runs its standard operating procedures well, it prepares it for emergencies. It doesn't mean you use them again. It better prepares you because you are ready. So I, I do agree with you that at times of crisis, uh, you need to take emergency measures. You may not be able to take your normal way of doing things. What I'm really trying to say is the more you do your normal things well, the more ready you are to take on crisis. That's it. But emergencies often need emergency action. Um, when does crisis begin? Uh, that's a good question. Um, sometimes it's on your doorstep, right? I mean, COVID came on our doorstep whether we liked it or not. Um, uh, but in many cases, it's a slow build-up. You know, if Ashanti Goldfields, you know, 20 years ago, was paying more attention to its hedge book and all of that, we may not have been where we were. Uh, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Uh, if we had known from the beginning, you know, the West African gas pipeline company would be five different companies instead of one, uh, we would have done things differently. I think the point oftentimes is, and, and we know this, sometimes there's nothing you can do about what happened. It's what you do about it. So did Wapco fix its culture problem and create one organization? Did Ashanti Goldfield fix its head book and make a different company? If you are able to manage the crisis, address a diagnosis, and address the way forward, you become a much stronger company. Other, oftentimes you have no control over when. It's what you do about it when it happens, would be, would be what I would say. I think the question on the right people is, is a very good one, because oftentimes, depending on where you are in the organization, you have no control. You are just a worker like everybody else. So it's not an easy thing to manage. But I think that over time, it is something you should recognize. And sometimes we are not brave enough, even as colleagues, to say, my friend is the right person. Or actually, my friend is not the right person. Sometimes we're not able to do that. But depending on the criticality of your function, you can't afford to have a friend who is not the right person. Sometimes in engineering, let's say in hydro dam management, there's a reason why the engineers and technical people uh, have to know what they're doing. But that applies for everything. It applies for accounting. It applies for marketing. What happens is that as you go up the corporate ladder, as you advance your career, there's more arbitrariness in decision making. I hope I'm making sense. When you come in first, you, you perform to a task. As you go up your career ladder, it's about the friends you've made, the connections you've made. A lot of other things happen. And that's why it's very easy for not the right people to be there. But I think our challenge, whether we are managers or not, is being able to say, this is the right person let's support him, or she's the right person, let's support him. That doesn't happen enough. I wouldn't really want to be in a position where I would have to manage crisis, because sometimes 
they will really be there. So I just want to ask, are there, apart from the SOPs, are there some preventive measures we can put in place to ensure that it wouldn't even happen, apart from the natural ones that we might not have control over? So that's a simple question. The board and the management for 30 days. You mentioned about Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy keeping his top security people for 10 days. Um, I wanted uh, just to find solutions to something that is they, they have termed crisis. And I wanted to find out whether as a country, Ghana, we are not um, ensuring that we find solutions internally or just because we have systems that seem to be biased in terms of implementation of policies, uh, these have crippled our um, leadership and caused more harm than good. And then the second question has to do with whether we have too wide a materiality scope so that if we have interest rates rising to the level of 41%, it is quite reasonable or we can consider that a high risk for us to think and uh, through it and look for uh, rapid solutions to what we call crisis in Ghana. Thank you. In times of um, doubling, in times of crisis, should someone be blamed? And if so, should the blame be um, necessary before they start managing the crisis or is it supposed to be an afterthought after the crisis? crisis and navigating challenges, I would like to focus on the issue of unemployment as a result or outcome of crisis, like you mentioned that the CFO lost his job at Asante Gold and the sweeping of boards. As someone knowledgeable in governance, what government policies could be implemented in Ghana to address unemployment and how can they be developed to have a positive impact on the people? <laughs> Lose their jobs because of a crisis. And I had a question too. My question was, on the Ashanti Gold Fields issue, that we are saying that, as you said, the person lost his job because he designed this sophisticated um, instrument. Right? And my thing is, is this a crisis? There's a school of thought that believes that look deep, try to find the root causes of the issue rather than pointing fingers, right? It looks like, in this case, um, fingers were being pointed at people and they were thrown out. I am thinking that rather you should look deep and find the root causes and tackle it because I think it's more structural than just taking one person to one. So it's just to back. Um, um, I, I think the Dean asked a, a very good question and it relates to many examples that I'm aware of. How do, you, how do you prevent the big crisis? Sometimes governance is a day-to-day -day thing. Um, um, if we were doing a regular monitoring of events, if we were uh, having our meetings review information and ask the tough questions, um, the big crisis will not happen. I mean, there's a reason why a lot of organizations insist on weekly meetings or daily meetings. If you're in operations like uh, oil or even gold mining, the operators meet every day. What are we doing today? What are we doing today? So sometimes just that exercise of meeting, talking, reviewing the information, it's like a security guard. You're walking around, looking at the information, and making sure there's nothing funny going on. And a lot of crises happen when you are not paying attention. That's what happens. You, you, you take it for granted. You think everything is fine. You trust your CFO. But a lot of the time, preventing the big crisis is a very mundane thing. It's every day you pay attention. Every day you read the report. And I can tell you, that even that act of regular review, regular meeting, goes a long way to prevent the big crisis. And a lot of people just fail to do that. And that, that, is, that is true and that is real. Um, is the lady there to talk about materiality? Well, what yes, do you mean? Thank you. Um, 
I was considering the fact that if two people out of the number of employees of Ashanti Gold, uh, Ashanti Gold at the time, just just two people who lost their lives, could make you that aside the gas pipe could make you sit and think to avoid such an um, occurrence. Is is the interest rate in Uganda the rising and the rapidity of its rise? Is it something to consider? as a, a, a quite material for us because if you look at america just one percent rise in the interest rate a race is a crisis so what is sure. i think that's an excellent question it's what we it's what we accept as okay i am sure you told some of your friends i'm asking uh, inflation is 50 percent in ghana they, they will think you're from the moon but we live with it as if it's okay. But as you said, there are many citizens in other countries who will find this completely unacceptable. And you recall about a year ago, thereabouts when people were coming down from COVID, the UK was at I think 10% interest rate uh, and uh, inflation, the US was about nine. Completely unacceptable. Completely unacceptable. We could live with 50% and it was okay. So it's very much about what we are willing to live with. But, you know, I'll tell you a story. When I went to the VRA for the first time, um, fatalities on the job, especially in the North, were okay. They were accidents. There are many companies, especially operational ones, who work every day, whether they are for oil or mining, one fatality is one too many because it says something about what you did on the job there are no accidents so back to the issue of blame game someone said structural i think it's a very good point uh, what i would say my personal opinion we don't have enough accountability in this country we just don't uh, we don't have it across the board in our political space in our business space. When we let the CFO go, it had nothing personal to do with him. And there always are two aspects of things. There's the structural, there's the systemic, and then what do you do about it? I am sure many of you have read and heard the stories of how public officials in other countries resign the day they find there's a mass shooting somewhere. In fact, there was an incident about two weeks ago where I think the Belgian justice minister was in the news, resigned because someone committed a mass shooting. And why did he resign? Because he had let him go through the justice system when he had had a chance to prosecute. It happens a lot. Japan is a great example of how executives resign when there's a failure. Have you heard about people resigning for any reason? So what I would say is, if we make it personal, then it is a blame game. If we say, on the other hand, we have created conditions where you can behave this way, then it's not a blame game. It's a collective responsibility that we have to fix. And that's the difference. And so what I've seen is that any time there's a crisis, the US in particular, which I know well, they will analyze it to death to understand how did it happen? Because they don't want it to happen again. It is that simple. And if we think that 50% inflation is good, then we will not examine it. But if we think it's bad because it erodes the purchasing power of our citizens, we will do everything we can to fix it, and we will find the right people to fix it. But that is not how we do. And it's not about the blame game, it's about fixing a system that we all end up benefiting from. And then the last point about uh, unemployment. Uh, there is a crisis, and it sort of goes back to what the Dean said. But that crisis didn't start yesterday, right? It's, it's been building up for years and years and years 
it has very much to do with what I talked about, the, the size of the private sector, because the private sector is the biggest employment employer of people. If the private sector was even two times the size it was, it would be hiring four times as many people. And, but those things take time to think through, and we, we were just not in that space. So some crises take a long time to build up. I think we just need to find the political will, the space, the governance to address it. But as an organization gets bigger, if it's a country, it just becomes difficult. If it's your small company with three people, I forgive me for saying that, you can manage it. And I think we're in a space where a lot of things are just hard for us to do. But countries do it. Countries do it. We're no different. On that note. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> We've enjoyed ourselves so much. In this class, there are no teachers, there are no students. Everybody is a student. And learning is a continuous process. It is infinite. There's no time to say I've finished learning. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We are grateful for your time. So all too soon, we've come to a close of a very thought provocative lecture, right? And that's governing in times of crisis, navigating the challenges. I want to take the opportunity to express my profound gratitude to every, each and every one of you here, especially to the leadership of the faculty for making this happen and also to the guest speaker. We are very, very much grateful. Again, earlier I made mention of the fact that as a chair, my duty is to create the ambience or the serene environment for us to have all this important dialogue or discussion. And I think I couldn't have achieved that without your cooperation. And I say a very big thank you and a equal to everyone here. As we vacate from this auditorium, may we carry the spirit of learning on collaboration in our chest and make sure that we become doers of what we've heard today. And one thing that I'm going to leave you with is that whenever we are confronted with challenges, we should start thinking of solutions. Because crisis management, if you see the challenges, you are not going to win over the crisis. But immediately you see there are solutions, then obviously there is an end to the problem. And again, crisis management is not an act of God, right? The crisis itself is not an act of God, and the management of it is also not an act of God, right? What it is is that it is just like you have your vehicle. You need to do preventative maintenance. Otherwise, managing crisis is expensive. So when your engine breaks halfway in the road, become expensive because at that point you don't need to lubricate it with an oil you need to buy the whole engine thank you very much for your audience god bless you all Distinguished guests, the chairman, all protocols observed, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Faculty of Management Studies, we extend a heartfelt gratitude to Mr. Kweku Awachi for his enlightening and thought-provoking session on governing in times of crisis. His insights and expertise in the field of governance and management of crisis has left us with a wealth of knowledge and a renewed sense of purpose. His engaging presentation has enriched our understanding on the challenges and opportunities in turbulent times. To our chairman, we want to say a big thank you for taking time off your busy schedule to join us today. 
And to all of you who joined us in person, we say a big thank you. Your presence and active participation has enriched the discourse and made this event a success. To God be all the glory. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you very much, Madame Jennifer Siddell.